All right, would you turn your Bibles to Daniel chapter 9, uh, and I'll just lay out the next couple of weeks. Uh, we're going to be together. Uh, I'll be with you the next this week and the next two weeks. I'm hoping we'll finish Daniel 9 by then. If you've read ahead, Daniel, the end of Daniel 9 gets tricky, but I'm telling you, it's starting to coalesce in my mind, and as it does, it is getting more and more exciting. Uh, and so I can't wait to unpack that or unfold that with you. Uh, and then uh, J- July 11th, Pete's going to preach. July 18th, I'll be back to preach. The last weekend in July, I'll be in uh, Rancho Cucamonga and preach at Eric's church there. And so Marsha will fill the pulpit. And then school will start again and summer's over. And we'll, we'll kind of finish up Daniel and move on to something else. But uh, as we come back to Daniel... This section that we started last week on prayer really is beginning to to focus us on this idea of forgiveness, of forgiveness. And the word, uh, the world cannot figure out the concept of forgiveness. Forgiveness as a word is not just unique to the Christian faith. Uh, It's not even unique to religion necessarily, but I think forgiveness is a word that everyone in our culture will use at some point form or some time or another. Oprah Winfrey, have you heard of her? She tried this definition on uh, forgiveness. True forgiveness is when you say thank you for that experience. Okay. Gandhi, he said the weak can never forgive. Forgiveness is the attribute of the strong. All right, I can understand what he's trying to say, but it falls short of any kind of biblical definition. Tim, Tony Robbins said forgiveness is a gift that you give yourself. Excellent. It's all about me. And as a bonus, this is just bonus, this doesn't count, but Michael Jackson, I don't know if it's too soon, he said it all begins with forgiveness because to heal the world, we first have to heal ourselves. And to heal the kids, we first have to heal the child within, each and every one of us. I thought about that. I said he was closer with the song, I'm starting with a man in the mirror. He should have just stuck there. I'm starting with him to change his ways. We all want forgiveness. I think forgiveness is something the the human heart, the human condition longs for, but we don't always understand how to get it. And when we don't understand how to get it, we can never fully embrace its reality. Forgiveness then is elusive. When someone sins against us, the best we can try when we don't understand forgiveness is try to forget it. Have you ever had that in a situation with with somebody that you know and love and and they sin against you and they, they say they're sorry and what's the response? Ah, forget about it. By the way, can we forget about it? We can't, right? If somebody wrongs me, I could say, ah, don't worry about it, forget about it. But you know what's going to happen the next time it happens or when I contemplate it or when I think about it a a day, a week, a month, a year from now, I'm going to remember it. I can't not remember. I can't not forget. So so I can't just say forgiveness is forgetting about it because it's going to continue to pervade my mind. Or forgiveness is we try to exact justice by requiring payment. I will forgive you, but you better do X, Y, and Z, or I won't forgive you anymore. You need to pay for what you've done. And here's how forgiveness like that, unbiblical forgiveness works in a marriage. That because you can't forget it, is, you, is somebody in a marriage apologize for, for their sin, you say, okay, uh, I'll forgive you, but I'm not going to forget. And that continues to be brought up in your marriage. Or you'll say, yeah, you need to pay that off. You need to work. You need to do things for me to actually forgive you. And how does that go in marriages? Not well at all. There's no grace there. In fact, right now in our culture, there is a religion, a worldview that is raging out of control. And we see this in the popular teaching on the serious subject and issue of favoritism, or the world will say racism, and instead of driving people to the gospel for change, for repentance and reconciliation, the only way to deal with this sin is to pay for it, to become an anti-racist, but you can never do enough to overcome your real or perceived racism. See, the Bible defines forgiveness this way in Ephesians 4.32, Be kind to one another, 
tenderhearted, forgiving one another, and then this phrase, and you should remember this phrase, as God in Christ forgave you. As God in Christ forgave you. How did God forgive us of our sin? It's what we're gonna see at the end of Daniel 9, what God did to forgive our sin, but, but here's the short answer. What did God do? Is he took all of our sin for all time and he put it onto Christ and he had, he had total satisfaction for his wrath and anger on our sin. Isn't that right? That's the gospel message. Is he's taken our sin and he paid for it because he had to have payment for it so that he can then look at us and actually give us forgiveness because that's been paid for. Why can we then forgive one another? And how do we overcome the the lack of forgetfulness? Is forgiveness then on a human level becomes a proactive thing, which I say, I can never forget what you've done against me, but I can choose not to remember. See the difference? Forget about it means it's very passive. Choosing not to remember says, yes, every time in my mind I remember what you've done, I'm gonna say that has been paid for on the cross by Jesus. It's been exacted, all of the wrath has been exacted, and now I can choose to, for, to remember it no more against you. That's what forgiveness works this way and this way. I mean, it is monumental the change that makes in our relationship with the Lord and with each other. This is the foundation of forgiveness. It explains freedom that we have, and this is the nature of this passage this morning. It's why we have the freedom to confess our sins regularly, knowing that forgiveness is had in Jesus Christ. We are in one way forgiven once for all. Christ Jesus died, he paid for our sin once for all. The reason I don't have to keep getting saved over and over again, the reason I have assurance of my salvation, the reason why I can't lose my salvation is all of my sin, even the sin I'm gonna commit tomorrow is already paid for. So then you'd ask, why do I confess now? Because now it has to do with relationship. Now it has to do with, am I, am I in a position to commune with God? Have I, have I in any way displeased him or cut off this, this relationship temporarily because of my sin? And I can deal with that regularly. He's never going to cut me off. It's like in a marriage, I know my wife's going to love me, Aaron's going to love me no matter what, but that doesn't mean we don't practically have times we have to work through issues in the, in the present. So forgiveness by God is a once for all thing and then that frees us up to have an ongoing relationship where we confess our sin, we repent of it, and we turn. So as we come to Daniel 9, starting in verse four, we're gonna see that all the way down to verse 19 is this one massive prayer of Daniel of confession. And the reason he could confess is he knew there would be forgiveness to be had on the back end of that. So let's start here in verse four. And we'll start with the the adoration in confession. We start with adoration even as we're confessing our sin. Here's what Daniel prayed. I prayed to the Lord my God and made confession, saying, O Lord, the great and awesome God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments. Stop right there. Stop right there. Before he actually gets into the content of what he's asking forgiveness for or confessing, he started with just adoring the Lord. Now, some of you haven't been with us the last few weeks, but last week we started to delve into this prayer in Daniel 9. And we got front row seats. I mean, it's fascinating. We got, we got this access through the spirit of an 80-year-old, 80-ish-year-old man, a saint who has walked with the Lord his entire life, and we have access to his prayer. And we, we look, if you look at verses one to three, you see that Daniel's foundation of prayer was the word of God. What spurred on his prayer was a knowledge of God's will through God's word. Isn't that helpful? Right, sometimes you're like, I don't even know how to pray. Like, what am I supposed to pray in this situation? And when we're not informed by God's word, sometimes we pray things that are simply for our own selfish gain, and we wonder why God doesn't answer those. We said last week that God makes his will very plain to us, and, but it's found in God's word. So God's word 
is a conduit to proper prayer or praying the right kinds of things that God will answer. Not only that, but we said seeking God was the target of our prayer, that we actually want to seek him, not just seek his gifts. God's not a genie. He's not there to be the lamp to be rubbed and get stuff from him, the Pez dispenser that that you lift the head and the, the, the candy comes out. We go to God to seek him to be in his presence. Daniel prayed with fervency. He, he prayed long, not just, not just long in one setting, but he continually prayed. We, we look back before in Daniel that he prayed three times a day in a, in a regular habit for his entire life. And then we said you need humility to fuel your prayer. In this, we gain principles. This, these are principles for all of life in every prayer that we would pray as Christians. So, but Daniel's main focus of this prayer was to make confession, which simply means the, the idea of confession is to submit and agree with God in terms of breaking his command. We looked last week, too, that Daniel's purpose in this prayer was he did his study of God's word, he did his calculation of chronology of years, and he knew that 70 years was up, that God had had poured out his anger for his sin, he had corrected Israel, he was going to bring them back to the land, and Daniel prayed, fulfill that, bring us back into the land, but Daniel also knew this, Israel's issue wasn't one of geography, It wasn't just that they were cut off from Jerusalem. The issue with Israel was they were cut off from God. And so the only way that they could go back is if they actually confessed their sin. The only way that they would change, the only way that they would stop the cycle of continually being under God's wrath was to confess their sin and receive forgiveness for that sin. And so that made up the prayer of Daniel. He's saying, I want to make confession, not just publicly, but personally and corporately, And this really shapes the rest of the prayer. In fact, I would argue that this is this was the answer to his prayer was verses 24 to 29 when he received a vision of future things. Verse 27, there is no 29. So it's important to see that Daniel started with adoration. It's always a safe place to start. This not only acknowledges who God is, but emphasizes the simple fact that we are not him, right? When you start with adoration, you come into God's presence. And honestly, like when you come into God's presence, I think sometimes we've lived in this this side of the cross and the idea that we have access to the God of the universe almost loses its emphasis. An Old Testament saint knew they had no access to God except for a priest. They had to make sacrifice. They had to go to a priest. They couldn't go go to God directly. We can go to God directly, but we also kind of understand that every time we go into God's presence, we don't kind of belong there. We we understand that, that we're a little bit out of place. Now, he's given us access through Jesus, but we understand that this is an awe-inspiring place to be, and so we don't come quickly into his presence, and adoration helps us know who we are and remember who he is. It keeps us from rushing to him and forgetting that we are entering, his, entering into the presence of the perfect, holy, powerful God of the universe. Dale Davis said it this way, Daniel teaches us how to adore and to rejoice over God, to do so briefly but genuinely. And this is something we can do in our prayers in spite of the circumstances or feelings, in spite of going to him and asking for things, simply because God is who he is he is and what he says he is and that he does not change despite the mess that I may be in. And notice there's three concepts, three words, three principles of how Daniel adores God before he makes his content of confession. The first is this, is he prays to a sovereign, powerful God, a sovereign, powerful God. He says, God who is great and awesome. I, love, I like those words, great and awesome. Sometimes in modern vernacular and nomenclature that we use, sometimes we use words that are lofty words, but we, but we minimize those words by usage. Awesome is one of those words. It's kind of like if you go to 7-Eleven and you get sushi at 7-Eleven and you go, this sushi is amazing, you're probably using amazing wrong. Uh, If you go to the DMV 
and, uh, and you say, man, their customer service is fantastic, you're probably using fantastic wrong. Uh, if, if, you, uh, if you say the national media's coverage right now and objectivity are just exceptional, you're probably using exceptional wrong. We are pretty flippant with the word awesome. And if everything is awesome, thank you, if everything is awesome, then probably nothing is awesome. If you say, man, how was your time away, uh, you know, in this day? It was awesome, was it? Like, like I, don't, I think we've lost the emphasis of what the word is, awesome. It's fine to use it in our normal vernacular, but, but when Daniel prays his prayer, awesome comes from the Hebrew word, uh, root that means to fear, and thus the word means the one who inspires fear. God's greatness or sovereignty is not a sort of sovereignty. It's an absolute kind of sovereignty. He is wholly other. And when we enter into his presence, it should be in a sense of awe, of almost terror. Like we should almost be terrified to come into God's presence. And so Daniel uses a word that captures that, that idea. And he goes, God is awesome. Now, sometimes we'll say, oh, God is awesome. But we really mean he's like kind of cool. He is, he is holy, other, a consuming fire. And so we don't come flippantly into his presence. But it also means because he is great and awesome, it reminds us the one we're praying to can actually fulfill and do what we ask for. Every father today wants to give good gifts to his kids, but we are limited in what we can do for our kids right? All of us are limited. God is not. When we pray to an awesome God, we're acknowledging you can actually do the things we're praying for because he is ultimately sovereign. Second, God is faithful. God is faithful. He keeps his promises. Notice in verse 9, uh, nine verse 4, he says, I made confession saying, O Gore, O Lord, the great and awesome God who keeps covenant, who keeps covenant. Now understand this, how a covenant worked is if you would enter into a covenant, you would swear by that covenant, you would typically uh, put, break an animal apart, you would walk through that, that animal's carcass and say, if I break this covenant, may the same thing be done to me. Who did God swear by, by the way? When God made a covenant, who did God swear by? The highest person he could ever swear by, which is himself. And he always keeps up his end of the bargain. When, when Daniel is citing God's covenant-keeping promises, he's citing things like the Abrahamic covenant. And in the Abrahamic covenant, what does Israel, what, does, what do Abraham's descendants, what do they possess, what do they gain? What is it? Land. They have possession to the land that God has promised. And Daniel is saying, we're going to go back to the land because you promised you kept up your end of the bargain. You never, never go back on your word. We always do. We always fail. We, we tend to break promises. We don't keep integrity, but God always does. Listen, that's why we can pray that when God says it, he's going to do it. But God's faithfulness cuts both ways, doesn't it? We typically think about God's faithfulness in a very positive sense. He's going to forgive us. He's going to act on the things that he promises, but also God's going to be faithful to his judgments. One of my favorite hymns, uh, we had it in our wedding. It's funny, uh, in Aaron and my wedding, we had congregational singing. When I do weddings now, I'm like, are you guys going to have singing in your wedding? They're like, what? Kids these days. Anyway, uh, but we sang, great is thy faithfulness, O God my Father. There is no shadow of turning with thee, right? That, that great hymn. It comes right out of Lamentations chapter three. Lamentations, uh, if you know anything about the, the prophet Jeremiah, Jeremiah was known as the weeping prophet. Everything he told Israel came to pass, but everything he told Israel about judgment coming uh, in the fall of Jerusalem, they refused to listen. In fact, Lamentations reads like a eulogy at a funeral. 
And in the midst of this, in the midst of this eulogy, as he's talking about how God poured out his wrath and his judgment on Jerusalem, and they're going to be carried away, in the middle of this, it's great is thy faithfulness, O Lord, my Father, to remind the people that God, even in judgment, is faithful. But we remember, listen, God will keep his word. Folks, time, time is undefeated. God's word is undefeated. If he says there will be judgment on those who do not turn to him and believe in him by faith, in those who continue on in their disobedience and sin, there will come judgment and he doesn't mess around. He keeps his promises because he is faithful. Daniel was not buttering God up by saying he was faithful, but was soberly yielding to him. And last, notice here that God is love. God is love. God keeps his promises because he is loving. I talked to a friend uh, this week who uh, I've known her for many, many years, and for many, many years she struggled with the idea of faith. She understands judgment but has a hard time understanding God's love. No greater love than God would forgive. No greater demonstration of God's love than that he would send Jesus to die for us while we were still what? Enemies and sinners of him. God is love, and particularly he loves those who keep his commandments. We we know that God loves the entire world, right? He he loves everybody, but he, he has a particular love for those who are called by him, who actually know him and obey him. 1 John 4, 7 and 8 and 16 says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love, verse 16. God is love and whoever abides in love abides in God and God abides in him. God loves his own and from that love keeps his promise to forgive and to act and to hear. We love, we know this because he first loved us. Look in Daniel 9, look real quickly at verse 23. I love this, we'll cover it next week. But, but Daniel received a vision and an understanding of the future. Why? Because the angel Gabriel told him, for you are greatly loved. You are greatly loved. Folks, don't miss that. Even in the midst of struggle, even in the midst of trial, even in the midst of you're trying to wonder why is the world crashing down around you, God hears your prayer because he loves you. He's faithful to his word and he is sovereign. He can make things happen. So Daniel started with adoration of a God he knew and he loved and moved to confessing of the sin that faced himself and the people. So let's look, look real quickly from verses five to seven. Five to seven. So here's he's getting into the content of what he's actually confessing. He says, we have sinned and done wrong and acted wickedly and rebelled, turning aside from your commandments and rules. We have not listened to your servants, the prophets, who spoke, to, uh, who spoke in your name to our kings, our princes, our fathers, and all the people of the land. To you, O Lord, belongs righteousness. But to us, we deserve open shame. So this begs the question a bit. We already covered it a little bit, but what is confession of sin and why would we do it? What is confession of sin? For some, uh, you grew up thinking confession of sin somehow had to be done to a faceless priest uh, next to you that you don't know, but you had to confess your sin to that person. And that somehow to absolve yourself of that sin, you had to do certain things to make absolution. Listen, we are a kingdom of priests. When Christ died, we have access to God the Father, and we don't have to go through a priest. We can have access directly to God through Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. So we have access to confess our sin regularly. You might ask this question, if God knows all things anyway, why do we need to confess it? He already knows I sinned, why do I need to confess it? We know that our sin is a stumbling block to our joy. It keeps us from intimacy with God and it forms a callous over our heart. Do you want to get a cat like uh, when you become a Christian, you are given a new heart. It is now, it was a heart of stone, now it's a heart of flesh. 
and, and now that heart is pumping and it's healthy. Do you know how you get heart disease as a Christian? You keep disobeying and you don't confess your sin. You keep hidden sin. You keep sins of omission. And pretty soon what happens to that heart is it cut, gets covered in fat. It gets callous. It doesn't pump as well. And we definitely don't feel as well. And we get really tired going upstairs. I don't know how that works in the analogy, but you know what I'm saying. Is, is, is it calluses our heart. So we want to regularly confess our sin because sin hardens our heart according to Hebrews 3, 12 and 13. We freely confess our sin because of the promise. If we confess our sin, he is what? Faithful and just to forgive our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. What a promise. What a promise. So honest confession and turning from sin on a daily basis keeps us from the hardening by the deceitfulness of sin. So what do we learn from the confession of Daniel? Let's look at what he what he shows us. Confession is open admission of sin. Confession is open admission of sin. By the way, we can all openly admit today that what unites us all together is the fact that we're all sinners, correct? Every, if I look you in the eye and go, sinner, that's not a bad thing. I probably won't do that. But understand, that is the reality. All of us are, are sin-laden. None of us have conquered our sin. All of us are battling. So here's here's what's fascinating is Daniel deals with the confession of sin in two ways. One is he he talks about personal confession and then he goes to corporate confession. I want you to see that. Look look at verse 20, uh, verse 20 of Daniel 9. He says, while I was speaking and praying, and he says, confessing what? In chapter 9, verse 20, confessing what? My sin, my sin. So Daniel wasn't just saying, man, you know the problem with Israel is all the Israelites. Do you know the problem with Grace Church is all the people of Grace Church? Do you know the problem with evangelicalism is all the evangelicalism? Where did Daniel start? He started by confessing his own sin. There's power in that. If you want to pray for others, do you know where you start? You pray by first confessing your own sin. I told you last week There aren't too many characters or or people study that you would people study that you do in scripture where there's nothing negative said about them. Do you know that Daniel had nothing negative said about him in the whole in the whole Bible? Jesus. And then I had somebody point out like Enoch, because there was like one verse said about Enoch. He didn't have time to talk about his sin. I'm like, touche. List of all the uh, genealogies. None of them said they were sinful. Anyway, you know what I'm saying. Is that, is that Daniel, there's nothing recorded, and there's a lot recorded about Daniel, but Daniel was a godly man, and what made him a godly man is he knew his sin, he didn't fight it, he understood what he needed, and so he confessed his sin. But then what I want to show you, look at, I just, just scan your Bible. Okay, nothing, nothing delights me more, by the way, when I see you guys looking down at your Bibles. Now, you may be looking at your phones and, and doing different things, but if you look at your Bible, look with me, just, just scan from verses 5 down to verse 16. Look at what, look what this, this prayer was. Notice all the parts of speech, the personal parts of speech here that he uses. Notice the repetition of three particular words. Look at the, the word we, the word us, and the word all. All, us, and we, and our. How's that one? All, us, we, and our. How many do you see? You see a lot of them, don't you? All of a sudden, you start to see, we have sinned. We have not listened. To us belongs open shame. We have sinned. We have rebelled. All of Israel has transgressed. God has been poured out uh, on us because we have sinned. Verse 13, uh, we have not entreated the favor of the Lord. Verse 14, uh, we... Uh, He has brought it upon us. We have not obeyed his voice. Verse 15, we have sinned. We have done wickedly. Your holy hill because of our sins in verse 16. You notice the corporate nature and the makeup of his prayer. Daniel knew that, that it starts individually, but he is not just an individual. He was part of a corporate identity. He was, there was, uh, uh, this corporate makeup of who he was. This has always been true of Israel. You remember back in Joshua chapter seven. 
Joshua 7, you'll remember Israel went into the land and they had conquered Jericho and then they got it handed to them at Ai. And the people were like, what is going on? Why can't we defeat Ai? And you remember why? Because of a man named Achan. And Achan had taken it on himself to take some of the idols and bury them in his tent. And you remember God brought Achan out along with his family. And you remember what happened next? Achan, what? Burned like bacon, right? That's what happened. He got consumed with fire. That's Right. Uh, anyway, he, that's what happened. There's a corporate solidarity that happens. And so Daniel understood that if Israel was going to be the kind of nation it needed to be, there had to be a corporate confession of sin. I think that is very helpful for us as a description of what happened for the church today. Paul is very clear in 2 Timothy 2 that what the church needs to be healthy and vibrant and effective is we is God's going to use clean vessels. No, we're not perfect, but when we don't deal with our sin, we limit, we, we don't limit God, but we limit what God can do through us. And so God's going to use clear, clean vessels. It's why, it's why we take communion. Next week we're going to take communion. And what is that time? It's a time of public public confession of sin. Not that we're going to do that public, but we're going to do it together and confess our sin. But we shouldn't just wait till communion days to do that. So there's a corporate and a personal revelation of sin. Second, there's honest evaluation. There's honest evaluation. Here's why I like this this list uh, in verses five and six. Sometimes when we talk about sin, we only focus on the externals or the biggies. And we think, well, why would I confess my sin? I'm not a drunkard. I haven't committed sexual immorality or adultery. I haven't murdered anybody. And so I haven't lied to anybody. And so we focus on these big overt external sins and we go, I haven't done those. I have nothing to confess. Notice this list of what Daniel confessed for the people. We'll do this rather quickly. Look at verse five and six again. He starts listing out, we have sinned and done wrong, acted wickedly, rebelled. Here is the list. The first he said, we have done wrong. We have sinned externally. We've actually done things that are disobedient. It doesn't take long in Israel's history, if you read the Old Testament, to see how they had done wrong. I mean, Israel's a great mirror and a picture of our own hearts and souls, but they they had engaged in all kinds of overt sinfulness, from pagan idolatry to child sacrifice, from replacing true worship to the practice of divination and prostitution, from worshiping God in the temple to creating high places and altars to foreign gods. If there was a list of doing wrong, Israel had capped it out. They had done wrong. And so he starts there, right? That's where we start. We go, here are the things that I've done, and I recognize these things I have done wrong, but he doesn't stop there. He says they had sins of defiance. Sins of defiance. Look at verse 5. And look at verse nine. Defiance, he defined by the word rebelled. We have rebelled. Sin is rebellion. And we are born rebels. We are born rebels from birth. Every time we sin today, it is an act of treason. Think about that. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, every time you sin today is an act of treason. A statement that declares that you do not believe that God is real or that his commands are not satisfying. Each time we choose to sin today, it's a shot in the face to the God of the universe who gave explicit guidelines for life. We're born rebels. Look at your kids. There's a reason why your kids, when you say no, what do they want to do? They want to go against it. We're born that way. We hate the word no. If you tell a kid, don't touch that, they go, thank you, I will touch that all day long. I'm gonna touch it twice as hard now. So praise the Lord that he died for rebels like us. Third, not only did they do acts of sin, they defied God, there was a defection, a defection. It was a turning aside from your commands and rules. This was not a sin of ignorance, but of defection. God had given clarity in his law, and we'll look at that probably next week. He had given clarity in his law, but they intentionally turned away from them, believing there was more happiness and joy apart from God's prescription of life. Isn't that what happens with us when we sin? 
We sin because we think it's gonna make us happy. And the answer to that is, does sin make you happy? Be careful how you answer that. Does sin make you happy? What's the answer? Does sin make you happy? Let me ask it again. Does sin make you happy? Yes, or you wouldn't do it. Listen, sinners. <laughs> There's a mirror. I understand. There's a mirror. The reason why we sin is it makes us happy. Does it make us eternally happy? No. Bring us satisfaction? No. But does it temporally make us happy? Do we at least believe it will? If I lie on something, I'll say, if, if, if I lie on something that has to do with money, I think I'm going to be more happy having that money than having my integrity. Isn't that right? If I, if I look, at, look at something to lust after it, I think that thing's going to make me more happy than, than staying holy. Isn't that right? And, and sin does satisfy for what? A moment, a time, a short amount of time, and then it fills us with misery. So sin... Any sin is a defection away from God. This type of sin usually is a slow burn, one that moves away by degrees and a thousand little decisions, slowly but surely drifting away from God's commands, compromising, capitulating in ways that don't seem like big deals in and of themselves, but collectively move our heart and lives away from God. It's defection. It's turning aside it's, listen, one of the hardest sins we have to deal with are not just sins of commission, they're sins of what? Omission. And we justify sin so many different ways and we, we, we are ignorant of God's commands. We say, well, I don't know what I'm supposed to do, so I'm just gonna stay ignorant and I feel better about myself. We're on the hook for those too. This level of confession, listen, is extremely important and demands high levels of honesty and self-evaluation. When, I can, when we confess our sin, it's not just focusing on the things that we've done, it's actually recognizing and evaluating the things we're not doing. It's understanding what are the things that God has called me to that I'm falling short in. Those are sins as well. And lastly, is there's just a deafness, a deafness. God used a myriad of ways to communicate to Israel from the given word to priests and prophets. He sent prophets to them to say, call them out of their sin and, and, and call them to recognize their sin. But they had this am amazing ability to tune the prophets out. Does that happen today? Do we ever tune out God's word? Do we have the, do we have the same amazing ability? To, to hear God's word, but not let it penetrate our ears and our minds and our heart? Do we have the ability that says, I know what's right, I know what's true, but you know what, I'm gonna do it my own way anyway. They were deaf to God's word. And Daniel says, we confess that we have not listened to you. When was the last time you prayed in a confession that way? God, I confess to you that I have not listened to your word. They would kill the prophets who brought truth or simply ignored their counsel in favor of their own. Does this resonate with us today? Any of those resonate with you? Not just the overt ones, but the sins of omission, the sins of defection, the sins of defiance. Notice that this list goes far beyond just doing sin, but shows the battleground has to do with our attitude and our heart, our everyday decisions, and actively obeying. What Daniel recognized is that Israel, what he says in verse 7, what did he say Israel deserved? Open shame. God, you are righteous, we are not. We know what we deserve because of our sin, and you are righteous to put us to open shame, and you did that. We're going to see next week that God prophesied that in the book of Leviticus and Deuteronomy to a T of actually what happened. Great omission. We're going to see next week is what was God was saying, I'm going to correct you. I'm going to bring in outside forces. I'm going to, I'm going to force you into this decision that you're seeing that the way you're living your life is, is a way that's leading to misery. Would you simply call out to me and ask for forgiveness and turn from those and follow me, and the people refused to do it. So the basis of Daniel's prayer was simply to appeal to God's mercy and forgiveness since they themselves had no basis of righteousness. 
Well, we're going to stop there as we get into the, the next section, and we're going to see the basis of why God forgives us, and then we're going to see his plan for forgiveness the week after. But it's, it's good just to pause there. Listen, I, I think a day like this, when we're celebrating dads, when we're talking about people moving on, on mission, it's good. And I know when we talk about confession of sin, it can be weighty and heavy and, and feel negative. I don't want us to leave there. The greatest love that God had for us, God is not the authoritarian God. There is no other God that is described in the universe, no other religion, no other authority figure who does what God does. God had every right, he has every right to snuff our life out right now. He has every right to put us under subjection that we'd have to work a lifetime into eternity to try to pay off our sin, and he didn't do that. In his love, in his in his uplifting, his holiness, his glory, and his name, he said, I'm going to give you my righteousness, and I'm going to forgive you of, my, of your sin, and the way I'm going to do it is through Jesus Christ. Today, know that you are loved. <laughs> I, just, I want you to hear that. After talking to my friend this week, know that you're loved. And how do we know we're loved? Christ died for us while we're still sinners. It frees us up to deal with our sin. If you have hidden, unconfessed, habitual sin, especially those who, I found this in counseling, is sometimes we have these sins, uh, the skeleton in the closet sins that we've never told anybody, that we think if people knew about, they would reject us, and it's just the opposite. We have the freedom to confess all our sin to the Lord because he is faithful and just to forgive us. A healthy church is a praying church, And an effective church is a confessing church. We are free. You don't have to bear your sin anymore. You don't have to feel the weight of that. You can be free of this calloused heart and you can get back to health. And how you do that is you openly confess to the Lord and receive the forgiveness that he has for you. I'd be remiss to to not say this in this last part before we pray. For some of you today, you've never, ever known what it's like to be forgiven of your sin. You've never tasted of that uh, forgiveness. You've carried the weight of your sin your whole life. You've gone through the motions. You've done religious things. You've sang songs. You've read the Bible. But you've never tasted what being free in forgiveness is. And here's the beauty of how God offers forgiveness, right? Christ did all the work. God did all the work for our forgiveness. And what do we have to do? We have to confess our sin We have to acknowledge our sin. And we say, I want to be rid of my sin, so God, forgive me, a sinner. Make me new, give me your righteousness, and now I want to serve you. Folks, if you've never done that, today is the day. Don't wait, because God is also faithful to his promise that says he will judge every person according to their deeds, according to their works. Let's pray. Father, thanks for a passage like this that causes us, forces us to think through these things. And Lord, I'm so grateful that we can confess openly our sin, that we are weak, that we are lazy, that we're disobedient. And and as we think through the nature of sin, that it even has to do with the things we're not doing that you call us to, that that you will hold us accountable to. I pray, Lord, that we would know what it's like to have forgiveness in Christ and have new life and have nothing in between our relationship with you. Help us to keep short accounts with you and with others. Help us to be free and willing to confess our sin, knowing that you're faithful and just to forgive and cleanse us. Help us to be effective and joyful as a church. We love you, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.